This is Mike Palmer. We're back from a successful trip to Austin, Texas for South by Southwest EDU. Thanks again to everyone who runs that conference. They really do an amazing job. It was great to see Austin is back and great conference experiences are back. And even more so, it's great that we can bring it all back to you so quickly, get the feeling of what it was like to be down there back out to folks who would have loved to have been there. We even got some live questions at the end, which I hope you'll enjoy. I'm going to get out of the way. Thanks, as always, for listening. We'll be back with our regular programming picking up again later on this week. This is Trending in Education. My name is Mike Palmer. I am the host of Trending in Education, which is the podcast we'll be recording for today. I have been doing that podcast since 2016, over 500 episodes. We release one or two episodes a week. So if you haven't subscribed, trendinginedcom trendingineducation.com. You can find us anywhere you find podcasts. And we're intentionally diverse. We try to not just talk higher ed, not just talk future of work. We've been talking a lot about AI. We'll talk about some chat GPT as part of this conversation. But the idea is that education can become a little too siloed. And one of the reasons I love this conference is that it's very much not. It it is actually an opportunity to learn from folks who may be outside of your lane while also getting those deeper connections to the people who are really focused on what you're focused on. I used to work at Kaplan Test Prep, did that for about 20 years, and then I've been doing my own thing since 2019 as a consultant. If you're interested in podcasting or getting any of your media presence together, hit me up and I'd love to talk to you. The other note is that there is a microphone here. If folks want to ask questions, we would love to hear from you. I will do my best to even interrupt the panelists if I see someone has the gumption to come up and ask a question. There'll be a formal point at the end when you can do that. But if the spirit moves you, We say such amazing stuff. You want to come up here? We'd love to hear from you. And we're going to try to run this a little bit like an improv session. So lots of yes ands. And with that, I think folks are filing in and out, but they're making decisions, which is, (laughs) which is good. You know, it's important to be cohesive. One other quick note. My wife is on the panel, Robin Naughton. My better half is on the other end of the stage. And my son and his grandma are also here. Right over there. Matthew is waving, but he's slightly, slightly shy because this is kind of overwhelming, but he's doing amazing so far. All right. That's the amenities they are dispensed with. Now it's time to dig in. I will be introducing my fellow panelists, beginning with Talanda, then Elliot, and then Robin, and then we'll get into our March Madness brackets because that's the other thing. This is, we have 16 trends. Each of us identified four Those are going to become our brackets. People can vote on those brackets this month and we'll determine a winner. Been doing that since 2017 with some interruptions due to the pandemic. And it's fun. We don't get too too crazy about it, but it is a fun way to to kind of get the conversation moving. So with that in mind, Talando, welcome to the podcast stage. How are you doing? And could you share with the audience who you are and how you got here? Absolutely. Good morning. It is so nice to be in a live event. I appreciate the energy from the audience. I'm the co-founder and chief strategy and culture officer at Escalera. We are an employee empowerment software company that does inclusion, education, and people analytics. And we use that to really scale learning and at an enterprise level. So most of our clients are in that enterprise space, large multinational corporations and so forth that are trying to really customize the learning to a global audience. That's me in a nutshell. I've got about 23 years of experience in the space of DEI, L&D, and culture change in organizations, kind of organizational development. Awesome. Well, that's a tough act to follow, but I'm going to do my best. I'm sure I'm going to learn a lot from everything you have to say. I'm Elliot Felix. I'm the founder of Bright Spot Strategy, and I'm the author of How to Get the Most Out of College. 
Brightspot is a higher ed strategy firm where we use design thinking to create more engaging and equitable experiences for students by helping colleges and universities improve their facilities, their student services, their technology. And after doing that with more than 100 colleges and helping a million students, which I feel pretty lucky to have, have done, I realized I'd learned quite a bit about the college experience and I'd seen firsthand how students might not feel a sense of belonging, they might not get the support they need, they might not see that connection between their classes and their career. So I wrote how to get the most out of college to kind of work the problem from both ends and help students and families and educators make the most of the college experience. Because if there's one thing I've learned, it's that colleges offer amazing things, but students don't always know about them. They don't always take full advantage of them. They don't always feel like it's for them. And whatever I can do to help students find their people, find their place, find their purpose, that's a good day at work. And just real quick, you're not just an author, you're also a podcaster. Yes. The book is short nuggets to help students design their experience, but there's only so much you can fit on one page. So each episode we dig into a tip. So it's like 15, 20 minutes on how to find a mentor, how to get an internship, how to do a great class project, uh, what dorm or residence hall to live in. Each time we talk to a student or an expert, basically people do that no more than me so that we can all learn together. Yeah. And it's, it's really great to hear student voices, which you can't really read in a book. But if you did want to read the book, it's available in the bookstore as well. Thank you. Yes, it is. And then Robin, please bring us home. Hi, everyone. Great to be here today. My name is Robin Norton. I am Assistant Professor, Web and Digital Services Librarian at Queen's College. And my focus is on user research. So I do a lot of work dealing with the library's website and going out and conducting research on our users and how best to design and develop interactive systems for them. A lot of my focus is on what do our users need? Who are our users? What do they do? How can we better design systems that really respond to those needs? As a librarian, there's a lot of those questions we try to answer on a day-to-day -day basis. So looking forward to talking. Yeah, and in addition to being a wonderful mom to Matthew, You've also had experience in enterprise. You've worked in a bunch of different roles, so you can represent for higher ed, but we're trying to, hopefully there's a nice cross-section here. That's one of the things I really love about this conference is that ideally you get exposed to things that you might not have otherwise if you were going to a higher ed or a K-12 conference or future of work, future of learning. Mm -hmm. We will be launching these brackets. That's our 16 trends. We'll be talking to them. A little bit over the course of the day is a little bit of a teaser. We'll be doing this throughout the month of March. There's also an episode dropping today. Basically, I had ChatGPT run a simulation of our tournament. So there's what ChatGPT said. That goes out on today's episode. And then throughout the month, hashtag Team Human will correct <laughs> Chat <laughs> which Hopefully, you've all had some experience correcting the bots. Don't let them... Don't let them push you around. All right. So these are the brackets. We'll come back to a bit. Just real quick history of what I've been doing and what I've been doing here at mm -hmm. South by Southwest EDU. We started trending in ed back in the fall of 2016 at Kaplan, really to kind of ch change the brand's perception, not being as transactional, actually being engaged in the community, looking at what's emerging that's worth paying attention to. Loved it so much, I eventually decided to leave. Kaplan and really do this full time. We did our first March Madness back in 2017. Interestingly enough, that one, there weren't a lot of people voting. So there were a lot of ties and it wound up that there was a tie between the importance of teachers and artificial intelligence, which is interesting. That if interesting. you think that that was back in 2017, it's still kind of true. Mm -hmm. We continued to run the, the thing. The next year after Parkland happened, one of the trends prior to Parkland was something we call kid solving, basically saying kids are the future. They can lead very much like my son is a future CEO of Palmer Media. You know, we identified that as a trend and then Parkland happened. And sadly, you know, that really was a place where we did see the rising generation really taking a lead. So that's something we continue to look at. Then our first time we came to... South by Southwest EDU was back in 2019. That year, Interactive Everything won. That year, we were in the Expo Hall on the stage, which was kind of cool. 
And then in 2020, I was supposed to fly down with Robin and Matthew, who was one year old. We were flying out on Saturday morning. And that Friday night, the mayor of Austin canceled South by Southwest. So we were still going to fly down with our one year old because who knew then what we know now. Anyway, fast forward over the last few years, we've been cranking out podcasts, launching other shows like Elliot's. If you're interested in what I'm doing, it's Palmer Media. Find me. I can hopefully help you navigate some of this stuff. And that takes us to where we are today, where the brackets are launching. And with that, each of us have four trends that we identified. Talanda's going to go first. Talanda, please take it away. Share with us. Your four trends. All right, I'm ready to get this party started. My first learning trend is learning in the flow of work. This really is about meeting people where they are. Right now, we have employees that are client-facing, employees that are remote, employees that are on distributed teams. They all need different types of learning leverage the intimacy that people have with their digital devices by a show of hands who checks their cell phone before they go to bed who checks it the first thing in the morning yes probably before you talk to your significant under one of the things that we've found is that people are often more candid in that space. And I think one of the extra parts of learning in the flow of work is that it has really integrated the flow of learning. And speaking of flow, what are your other trends? One of the big things that's happening in my space is really, you know, consumer grade learning experience. People are expecting things to look like they operate in every day. They want it to have a Netflix interface and it's interactive and, you know, TikTok elements and videos and all of these things, you know, using AI to also get recommendations. Hey, you did really well on this. The next step is this so that they can learn. And one of the things that I think is important in this consumer grade is that it's content agnostic. You know, I write curriculum myself also, but I do podcasts, you do TED Talks, you can bring in articles to it. Bringing in that novelty of different ways to learn a different topic really increases people's engagement with it and speaks to their differentiated learning styles. Everyone in this room, we're all competing with TikTok. We're all competing That's right. with the next new thing. My next one is... Nudging for inclusion. So using nudging technology that uses the kind of cognitive science principles, that nudging technology really helps connect people's intentions and what they say they want to learn with actual action. And this becomes critical because there is a huge gap in that when learning just stays at the awareness piece and doesn't move into the actions and the behaviors that people do. This allows us to give those actions and behaviors. My last trend is, you know, human skills, people, human skills, you know, yeah. COVID and everything else set us back a few generations and people have stopped understanding how to learn with people, how to even work with people, how to be in the same room with people. So, <laughs> and these critical durable skills, you know, have come to the forefront as even more important than people's technical skills or hard skills. The current technical skills and hard skills that are in most demand now weren't even around five years ago. And so these durable learning skills are, are you know, creating your self-awareness, social awareness, power dynamics, learning how to be resilient, learning how to manage conflict and de-escalate things. And those things, no matter what your job is, you know, the research shows that 58% of, of your job is just dealing with people and it can really get in the way if you don't know how to do those things. And so kind of hand feeding that and really building your skills, not just for the workplace, but one of the biggest comments we always get is like, hey, you know, this is good for my family. This is good to learn how to deal this stuff with my teenager right. because it's just people skills that you need for advancing in your career and everything else. So 
That was great. And then if you have thoughts, questions, there are still refrigerator magnets in my pocket. If folks <laughs> want to ask any of these questions, we're going to try to get through the first rounds. So everyone sees what everyone mm. has, and then we'll get into a little more discussion. These are Elliot's next. Thanks, Talana. So how many folks want to hear like hard data, metrics, numbers, stats? We'll show, show of hands. Okay. Some folks, how many people want to hear like student stories? emotional stuff. Okay. A little, uh, so I'm going to try and do, I'm going to try and do both. And my first trend is about belonging and belonging is so important because it's, it's like the lens that a college student sees their experience through. And if they feel a sense of connection, if they feel like they're part of something, if they feel supported, cared for, like they matter, then they have that sense of connection. And if they get a bad grade, if something bad happens, they have people to go to and they treat it as an opportunity to grow. If they don't, maybe they like imposter syndrome kicks in and you start, you know, you start circling the drain. Over the last 20 years, I probably interviewed about 2000 students. And one student that I interviewed for my book, I'm going to call him Eric. He found belonging as a transfer student. He was a student veteran. He was a transfer student. He knew, okay, coming into a new institution, how am I going to find my people? And he camped out at a student lounge for students of color studying STEM. And, you know, modest space, kitchenette, fridge, seminar room, student lounge. And that's where he bumped into people, went to workshops, you know, eventually started running workshops. And it turns out that these affinity group spaces where you can both find your people, feel secure, feel safe, be with people who you share something with, lived experience, race, religion, politics. That's what allows you to then go and reach out and spend time with people who are different from you and enrich your college experience. Unfortunately, in our survey, National Student Experience Survey we do every year, affinity group spaces are the second lowest satisfaction. Only 44% of students are satisfied with them. The good news is in another survey we did with 100 colleges, 48% are planning on improving them. So that's good. So thinking about spaces for specific identity and affinity groups is really one way to create belonging. The second thing I want to talk about is Zoom IRL. I don't know if you had this experience, but when my wife and I first had people into our house as COVID was waning, it was incredibly awkward. I mean, I didn't know what to stay. I didn't know where to stand, how far away. I, I, I was totally out of practice and it felt like being back at a middle school dance. <laughs> it was ridiculous. And so that's what's happening to students as they re-enter the classroom or they enter for the first time. And if you think about the National College Health Assessment says that 36% of students have an anxiety diagnosis. So if you think about a student who has never done this before, who's going into a 500-person a, you know, lecture hall mm. for the first time, like that's, that's, that's a lot. And there's been a lot of reporting recently on how students are bringing like Zoom habits to real life. They're multitasking in the lecture hall. They're disengaged. It's that same skill gap that Talanda was talking about. In the same way that Zoom habits are coming in real life, the third thing I want to talk about is how online and on campus are converging. It's sort of interesting because you, for a long time, we thought about online learning and on campus learning as separate. And in fact, you know, sometimes the faculty is separate. There's a separate tech stack. There's separate staff. You know, oh, that's continuing ed. Oh, that's online learning. That's different. That's a whole different set of instructional designers than, you know, than the people are doing on campus program. But those are actually converging and two thirds of students who are fully online enroll within 50 miles of home. Two thirds of students who are fully online go to campus at least once in their degree program. And Robin's going to talk about hybrid learning and that's clearly a, a convergence. But one of the things that I think is interesting is the parts of the physical campus that we took away for online learning are slowly getting added back in a curious kind of way because online learning first started off focused on the digital classroom, but we know that the college experience is so much more than that. And in fact, one of the things we survey students on, this is maybe my favorite question, is we asked them how they would allocate their tuition and they would only put 40% toward classes. So they recognize that there's this holistic experience and it's interesting to see the physical get added back into the digital. So for instance, 
online programs are creating storefront micro campuses to deliver student services like University of Washington has one, University of Phoenix has several where, you know, you, maybe you drop in to meet with a career counselor if you're, again, like two thirds of the people within 50 miles or early on we work and 2U partnered so that people that were enrolled in 2U programs could actually go to, and meet up at a WeWork. Or for a while during the pandemic, there was a startup called the U Experience that was actually creating, it's kind of taking over a floor of a hotel to create a communal experience for online students in a dorm-like atmosphere. The last thing I want to talk about is ROI, because the question of value is on everyone's mind. And I think part of that is what's happening just in terms of the social contract, education, upward mobility. I think Raj Chetty has done amazing work with this and found that a generation or two ago, we all had a 80% chance of having a better standard of living than our parents. And now that's down to a 50-50 shot. And so, you know, Andrew Yang during his presidential bid had this wonderful quote, which was, you know, education is in the last 30 years has gotten three times more expensive, but it's not three times as good. And so I think it's natural for everyone to think about value, especially because after the great recession, you know, the burden of the cost of education shifted from the state to the student. And so now it's only natural that everyone's thinking about the cost. But the great thing is there are awesome tools out there. And one of them that not enough people know about and even fewer people use is the college scorecard from the Department of Ed that was in Obama era. How many people have heard of the college scorecard? Also a few folks. Well, now it's got like 10 years of longitudinal data broken down by major. So you can actually look at what am I going to make if I major in this likely? Mm -hmm. And on average, higher education is a great bet, right? We've probably all seen the studies like Georgetown Center for Education, the workforce has one. Many have done. You get about a million dollar premium for going to college over high school alone. Mm -hmm. But the problem with averages is they can be very misleading. I like to tell people, you know, combined, Michael Jordan and I averaged three championships. <laughs> so averages can be very, can be very <laughs> misleading. And college isn't a good, doesn't pay off for everyone. So that's really what we have to work on. And one way of working on that is thinking about major and cost shouldn't be the only consideration, but now we have great data for people who want to consider it. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. I like the online spaces, your architecture background. If folks want to ask questions about how Elliot's thinking about space, higher ed, again, we encourage participation. Speaking of participation, my lovely and talented wife <laughs> will be participating next. Robin, what you got going on? All right. So the first trend I want to talk about is chat GPT. So how many people have used it, have heard of it? Oh, wow. Okay. And so I think what's happened with chat GPT, which is why it's one of the trends, is making teachers and students really think about writing, about the process. And one of the things that's happening in the classroom or just around chat GPT is like, what does that mean for learning? If your students are going out and using this tool to write their essays for them, what does that mean? And so it, be it begs the question is like, how are teachers going to respond to this? And what are some things that teachers can do with their students to make use of this tool? One of the things that is, you know, of question, and it's a challenge, is do we do something about this? Do we participate? Because it's chat GPT, it's the third iteration of it. And thinking about generative AI overall, this is not going to stop. This is not something that's just here for a moment and then it will disappear. What's happening is that there is a shift happening in terms of artificial intelligence. And the question for teachers, for educators, is to think about, well, how does that get integrated into the kind of work that we do and what we want our students to learn? Some of the things that we think about for this is that what should our students get out of this? Is the idea that they should have like a really nicely well-written piece of work that they hand out? Or is the idea that teaching writing is teaching thinking and teaching critical thinking skills? And so 
when they leave a class, they have these additional skills and tools to be able to convey that and do that kind of work. So I do think that's a trend. And I do think one of the things that we're trying to figure out, because this is moving much faster than tools normally do in higher ed and academia in general. So it, it appeared in November and now, you know, it's really big. And so that means it's moving really rapidly. So everyone is trying to figure out, well, how do we do this? How do we integrate? Some of the things that it doesn't do, which I think is what teachers are great at and what students need to learn to be better at is context. Context is an important component and that makes a big difference in terms of writing, in terms of sharing information and to be able to understand context and use these tools in different ways. My second one is hybrid learning and hybrid learn, hybrid work. You know, it picks up on some of the things that the panelists have already said, particularly what Elliot was talking about, this convergence. What COVID-19 did in a lot of colleges, my college, as an example, suddenly the shift to online is something that has been coming for years. Higher ed has been slow to shift to online at the level that they needed to. And so what I think COVID did was make them have to do it immediately, which highlighted a lot of things that's happening in the industry already and really brought forward some of the issues, some of the challenges, you know, some successes, some failures. But because of that sudden shift into this kind of online environment and this remote work environment, everyone now has to think about, like, how do we do this in a good way, in a sustainable way? We're at a place now where we're starting to shift back to in-person. Some of us probably more shifted than others. But in that shift back to in-person, what you're discovering is that students have learned that some things work well online as opposed to in-person. And some things work well in-person as well. So they're not refusing it. But what we, as the trend for this, what we're looking at is how do we create these hybrid learning environments? And I believe that is the future. I believe people will want the option to select the thing based on a format that works for them. So if they feel the need, so for example, their studio classes, like art students are going into the studio, you know, you're going to make something, the in-person experience is valuable. So you want to make sure that's there for them. But there's a lecture on art, you know, you need to listen to someone talk for an hour about something. You don't necessarily need to physically be there to do that. And I worked for the library, and one of the things that happen as we start to come back on campus and we have these kind of hybrid classes where there's some component in person and some component online, the library started to develop Zoom rooms. So you come to... <laughs> to the campus and you may have an in-person class at 10 a.m., but then you have an online class later that day. So you have a space to go to do your online class while on campus because Queens College is a commuter school. So a lot of people live some distances and come in. But ultimately, this trend is looking to say, how do we really integrate these two modes in a way that is seamless and sustainable and give our teachers as well as our students a choice? And this is not just for the students. This is also for the teaching and the staff and the faculty because they too have discovered they can do certain things remotely. And how do you design a work environment or a professional space where you really can take advantage of both modes of operation? So I think that's something we're certainly going to look at and try to figure out more. Then the third trend is the user-centered library. I'm a user researcher by training, so my focus has been on human-computer interaction and how do we design things that are easy to use and interactive. And taking that trend in libraries, it's been shifting into more user-centered work and more user-centered research. But the idea is in order for us to really respond to what's happening in the community, what's happening in librarianship, what's happening in education, we need to think of the library holistically as a user-centered space. And it's not just, oh, can they get the book? Yes, they can. They can get it online and in person. But we have to be able to think, you know, what is that path that a student or a faculty or someone takes when they walk into a library building or they go online to a library website? And how can we make sure that these spaces are integrated in a way that is user first and not necessarily things first, but more 
how do we design this so that they get a good experience? And how do we design the whole library? And this is from top to bottom. And that has to do with, you know, the strategy, has to do with the economics of it. It has to do with, you know, being able to touch on all the different aspects of, you know, cataloging and doing a lot of things in the library. So the user-centered library is really taking that lens and start to bring it into the library to make it more user-friendly. Libraries are being redesigned in part because of the digital transformation that's happening. The stacks have come out, the spaces are changing. There's a lot of interest in redesigning those space. In some ways, kind of building on what Ellie was talking about, there's almost a sense of feeling a sense of belonging in the library is, yes. a, is a new, and that's very much in line with the yeah, and that generated. Yeah, and very much in line with that. Even just the idea of just having Zoom rooms. Students come to the library. It's a very open space. It's a place where they feel comfortable, and they come to do all. It's a little mood lighting. Of... <laughs> I guess that means you got to get to your fourth trend, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so my fourth trend is container collapse. And how many people have heard of container collapse? Only because you talked about it at dinner last <laughs> Okay, so this idea is that, I know Talanda mentioned content agnostic, and this is ideas about format agnostic. Students and people are very much format agnostic. That means because you can get a little Twitter quote, you can get a blog post, you can get a nice quotation from somewhere. So you don't necessarily know the format of the piece that you're reading because you read in excerpts a lot. And as a result, so when I think container, and this will be an example, you've gotten an excerpt from this page. It tells you about this book and what it's about. But what you don't know is the origin of that piece of information. You don't know that it's held in a book like this, which has its own affordances and its own way of doing things. Another example of this is that, you know, if you ask students to go online and search for a journal, an e-journal or something like that, they don't really understand the concept of a journal. Because a journal is a container for multiple articles. So they will find an article and be like, oh, here's the journal. But they don't realize that that article is in a larger set that is held by this term we call journal. Because to find the information that they're looking for, they can easily find the specific thing they're looking for, but not necessarily where was that originated and where was that held. And so this idea of the container collapse, the containers are like books and journals and these larger holder of information that has been with us historically that is now slowly collapsing because the need for it is very different in a digital world where, you know, it doesn't matter the format. You get the piece of information that you need and you don't necessarily need that. That's great. There's a lot of that related to literacy. There's a whole books movement in literacy where rather than training people on synthetic articles, which increasingly are going to be written by generative AI, instead, you know, actually read The Catcher in the Rye or read... <laughs> A book, which is actually something we do have to advocate for, and mm. not to mention the books that we need to advocate for, is another issue that's out there. Also, a lot of mental models. If you're interested mm. in mental models, my wife can talk your ear off on <laughs> mental models. There's a lot to, to get at in there mm. as well. And now my picks, I'll try to move fast because we want to hear from you, and I'd love to get some... I'm a podcaster, so it's all about dialogue. Mm -hmm. But the first trend I have is Gen AI. And I was doing that really thinking about Matthew, my son, right over there, where in addition to Gen AI being generative AI, there's also a generation that is growing up around AI. And if we're not thinking about how do we design for an amazing four-year-old, we're going to be way behind in five, 10 years because right. this stuff is accelerating into the future. The second is what I'm calling polarized learning zones. Sadly, an example of that is my alma mater, which is New College of Florida, which is currently really under attack by the DeSantis administration. Mm -hmm. It's a progressive college that he replaced the board of trustees, basically added six new board of trustees. A lot of culture warriors came. And sad about it is that new college, that I, the new college that I know was very much about academic freedom, about a scholarly mindset, about critical thinking and engaging in difference. And, you know, it's now on the front lines. It, the good news, I guess, is it's getting coverage on, you know, CNN. So, you know, people didn't know about my college until recently, but mm -hmm. it's just an example of a trend, like a massive trend 
around education. It will be a political issue. You're not going to stop hearing about it. Youngkin in Virginia and DeSantis, you know, the, the rising stars, the governors within the Republican Party are very much putting the culture wars front and center. It's a place where we need to be conscious of it. It's something we're going to be tracking on Trending in Ed. And I'm also going to be launching a podcast dedicated to New College. So folks, if you're interested in that, I'm trying to spare my Trending in Ed fans, me getting nostalgic about my alma mater, which is under attack. But it's definitely something that hopefully folks are recognizing. And then the question is, how do we activate? How do we not even have one side win, frankly, but just turn down the temperature so that, you know, if you're an undergrad, you just need to learn. And the opportunity costs, the cognitive load that these kids are under being forced into the culture wars when they're still forming their identity. Yeah. Clearly, I could keep talking about that, but I'm going to keep moving. <laughs> the next one is both ending, which you probably heard a little bit of that from folks earlier, where is it AI or is it humans? It's really both. Mm -hmm. Is it online learning spaces or is it on campus? It's actually both. One of the human skills that we're going to need to develop and I think we'll still be ahead of the robot overlords, at least for a little while, is our ability to entertain complexity and understand that more than one thing may be going on at the same time. One of the things that's frustrating to me about the generative AI tools is that they'll tell you definitively stuff is settled when in reality, we know it's not. They'll just generate the words. We'll think there's a mind behind it. And if we're not critical of it, we're going to get steamrolled. So how do we activate? How do we get folks thinking in, you know, cohesive, thoughtful ways? It ties into all the other topics that we've touched on so far. And then the last one is parent power. You know, I'm an old dad. For a long time, I talked about breeders as others. <laughs> so I recognize non-breeders out there. I was pretty close to continuing on that path. But fortunately, I have seen the light. But if you think about it, you know, many times we're asked the same thing, both end. Like, you're not just a teacher. You're not just an entrepreneur. You're not just a DEI expert. You're mm -hmm. a parent or at least a, a, a child, you know, your parents somewhere. And it's like, we all wear all those hats. And then getting back to the politicization of education, a lot of it is coming from how parents were activated during the pandemic and really haven't gone away, frankly. And again, next year is an election year. Education is going to be a big topic and the role of parents and the way in which we can engage parents is really important. And again, I try to be nonpartisan on my show, but I do get frustrated when I feel like partisan people are claiming parents as theirs. And that's where I think parent voice, in addition to student voice, is one that we're going to need to continue to recognize. Those are my trends. This is the brackets. They'll be up on trendinginedcom all of March. In the spirit of Love. both ending and parent power, I'll just add that 20% of today's students are parents themselves. So there's a convergence there. Oh, we have okay. a question. Even better. We have a human. Thank <laughs> you, man. Really wanted a kitchen magnet. You're going to get um, one. Yeah. So I run global education at Netflix. And one of our trends that we've really been seeing and seeing for years is edutainment. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I just wanted to put a plug in for that. And really looking at how are you entertaining people while wow. you're educating them? Because mm -hmm. the old kind of e-learning right. um, is just people are just put to sleep. And you're just pressing, you're just pressing buttons to press them and to get through it because it's yeah. so boring. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I usually talk a lot about sexual harassment training for mm -hmm. corporations and how a subject that is so fascinating can be so deadly boring mm -hmm. and just you snooze through it and you're just like clicking away just so you can finish it. So, yeah. um, so ed edutainment is something that I'm just going to promote as a I'm a huge fan. In fact, coincidence here, when we first created Trending in Ed, the title I wanted for it was That's Edutainment. Yeah, nice. Mm. <laughs> Back in 2016. So, so I, I do feel you. The other trend that I've heard out there is called stealth learning, yes. which is yeah. that the learning kind of sneaks up on you, which is, and I, I also, I'm, I'm Gen X, grew up on Schoolhouse Rock. I still know how a bill becomes a law. I still know all about conjunctions because there's great media. <laughs> and I can probably hum a few bars if, uh. if you need me to. But we have more questions. So let's get more questions in. Thanks all for your uh, presentations. It's, it's interesting teaching in, in a classroom where with chatbot AI, it is, I think one of the things we all need to consider is why is the term paper, the be all and end all of demonstrating knowledge that maybe right. this can 
open up a kind of time inside the classroom that we can think about it in a different way. Mm -hmm. But teaching in graduate liberal studies, there is kind of the aspect of reading the great books, reading them closely, and this not being a kind of trend where we throw that away. I'm mm -hmm. wondering if you have sort of ideas around how this can be a yes and conversation right. around still maintaining that aspect. Thank you. I love that, the yes ending and the, the trend. And I'll just tell a quick story, which is part of how we try and help universities see around corners is shadowing what are called the lead users, the folks that are on the cutting edge. And I interviewed a professor at Georgia Tech who taught literature there. And he was thinking like, okay, how do I teach literature to engineering students? And what they did in the spirit of reading the great books is they read Walden and then they had to recreate Thoreau's cabin. They had to physically construct Thoreau's cabin. So it was like hands-on teamwork, right. going through the text, creating something. And they did it in the courtyard of the library. So it was, it was definitely like both ending digital, physical, past, present, yeah. individual team, great books great cabin. I also think that in that space, oftentimes we're trying to measure the wrong thing. And I think that one of the limitations of chat GBT is that there is no analysis. It's just kind of almost a, a researchy tool to, that can make nice sentences and so forth. And so I feel like a shift that has to really happen is what we are asking students to do, knowing that they're using those things. How are they bringing that analysis and critical thinking together? Yeah, I can add on to that. One of the things that happen a lot is that a new tool comes out and we get really focused on the tool and it's about the tool. But a lot of it, it's not about the tool. It's about what are we teaching and what do we want people to learn? And so learning how to use that tool is also valuable teaching right. because learning that this tool does not do X, but it does Y. And mm -hmm. how can I integrate that? So the real teaching is like, there are going to be many tools. So it's not just this one tool, but what, what if you teach them how to integrate that tool with their thinking, then when mm -hmm. another tool comes up, they have the critical thinking skills to make use of it and mm -hmm. analyze how that is being used. And I think right. that's the, the thing we have to do. It's not just about the tool. It's about no. what yeah. and we, can this provide and what can you provide? Right. And we're close to time. We have one last question. Also, I have, I have a couple of quick things. One is the difference between formative and summative assessments, where basically if they just want the finished essay, that's not where the learning happens. The learning mm -hmm. happens when you're actually shaping it up, you know? And, and then the second one is more about the future of work. If we're trying to model for Gen AI, mm -hmm. how are you going to ultimately be employed in the future? For New York City public schools to ban ChatGPT, to me, is going to really build a bigger barrier to employability on the other side. So obviously, that could be a topic of an entire thing, but I'd love to get at least one more question in, please. Sure, thank you. Interested to understand how the panel would differentiate for younger learners. What I mean by, you know, your son's age and younger, mm -hmm. who still are developing cognitively. A yeah. lot of what right. you guys are talking about is, you know, critical thinking, mm -hmm. chat. I mean, we have a generation of learners who are, may not even be literate yeah. or becoming literate first, second, pre-K, right. kindergarten. Right. right. Does your perspective change because of their cognitive development and how this innovation that you guys are talking about may change their, their perspective. I and mean, we had someone from Netflix talking okay. about education and entertainment. And I would beg to differ that ultimately, you know, I don't want my child sitting and watching Netflix for six hours straight, four hours straight. So I'd love mm -hmm. to try to differentiate between how in the world we could have them being entertained, yeah. playing with games, right. and they aren't mature and cognitively yeah. developed enough to do that. So I'm just curious. Man, we just have a minute left, and now we just started cooking. Yeah, that was, <laughs> yeah, that was, that was, a that good, was good on that multiple was... fronts. All right, let's lightning round until they kick us out. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> oh, a, a super uh -huh. quick example, I have a four-and-a-half-year-old and a seven-year-old, and one of the things we'll do is take things from the screen into real life. Like one of my favorite pandemic moments was we built the castle together from Frozen, mm -hmm. right? So I don't want I don't want watching Frozen all day, but we can watch it once, and then we can together like measure things out, glue things, tape mm -hmm. things. We can reenact scenes, and now mm -hmm. we're doing things in real life in a hands-on way based on a screen, mm -hmm. and like you know you can bring them together. Yeah, and I'm gonna throw moderation in there because 
one of the things I think the challenge is like screen time all the time, you know, ultimately, Mm -hmm. whether they're four or 44, you zone out eventually. So that is a problem that's a cognitive problem. But the idea of moderation is that, you know, you want to have the interactivity. You want to be able to say, okay, we can spend this time looking at this thing, doing this activity. But you also want to make sure that you're doing things in the world. And I think that's one of the yes. things that's missing a lot with, with screen and so forth, that you're not mm-hmm. doing things in the world. You're not running. You're not playing. You're not interacting. You're not creating. Mm-hmm. You're not generating new things. You're not engineering. You're not doing these things in the world. And if you're not doing these things in the world, then that's a significant problem for growth mm-hmm. and development. Yeah. But if you are saying, okay, we're going to, like your example is a great example. We're going to look at this thing and we're going to start to extrapolate from this thing and do something with it. Mm-hmm. And we can figure out, well, how does this exist in the world? What can we do? And that interactivity, that's kind of growth and development because I believe right. that does help young students to learn sure. and to create and right. to actually use their own brain for these. One of the challenges with, you know, looking at television and media is that you're seeing someone else's imagination. And one of the uh-huh. things you want to do is to make sure that your child can see their imagination as yeah. well. Right. And that's separate from that. Yeah, and I know I'm we're gonna, at time. You know, we're at time. But this is an argument also for the power of audio. There is an app called Pinna out there for kids, mm. which is similarly even with, with Netflix too, like building more tools that build those nudges to mm. get off. Commercial model of a lot of these platforms is stickiness. Once we have you, we want to keep you. Mm. I think a real challenge on the education front is when is it appropriate to break that model Exactly. So that learning can can really happen and be transformative. I actually do feel like we need to give people more opportunities to engage in these topics. But sadly, we are at time. You can still hear about it on Trending in Education once or twice a week. Been going 500 episodes strong. I have refrigerator magnets for the participants. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for joining. <laughs>